Leaders Talk, the interview podcast portraying leaders who are committed to better leadership, better organizations, and a better world. Powered by Leadership Choices. Hello and welcome to Leaders Talk, the biographical interview podcast for better leadership, better organizations, and a better world. My name is Carsten Draht, and I'm one of the managing partners of Leadership Choices. Our guest today is Olya Vasilets. Olya Vasilets is a coach and lives in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, she and her little son had to flee on February 25th after the start of the war. Um, and we will talk with her about her journey, about her journey to become a coach and how she sees um, the development of this war and also um, what people can do how um, are also conditions thinkable that will um, enable peace going forward. Um, a very inspirational, uh, strong woman. Um, and I can only encourage you to listen to this um, very carefully. She's uh, also specialized in resilience and uh, in her coaching practice. She also has been an entrepreneur, uh, has, uh, has done many different things in her life already. And uh, she also sees this uh, war as a big, big resilience test for the entire people of Ukraine. Um, a very amazing woman. And let's go right into the conversation with her. Let's go right into the talk with Olya Vasilets. A very warm welcome to Olya Vasilets. Welcome to the show. Hello, my <laughs> greetings from Ukraine. Hi, Olya. First question, you are in the Ukraine right now. How is the situation? Are you safe? Uh, yes, I'm in Ukraine right now. I, actually, I am in the central part of Ukraine uh, and it is quite safe here. Uh, I would not like uh, to say that it is absolute, absolute safety, but uh, it's quite safe. Mm -hmm. But during nights, you are shutting down lights to avoid any bombing. So it is, it is definitely not peaceful. It is simply there's not much infrastructure around and it's more in the countryside is that right yes it is countryside and uh, it's true that uh, we have a uh, blackout we have to uh, turn off uh, lights in nighttime and evening time <clears throat> and sometimes in daytime we also um, have to turn off the light mm -hmm. okay oh yeah um you're a colleague you're a coach um so very happy to, to have you here in our podcast. Um, also, I mean, both to talk about your own professional development, how you arrived being a coach in Ukraine, what the coaching scene in Ukraine looks like. But then obviously we also want to talk about the situation, about the war and what we can possibly do to help or to support. So maybe let's start with you first, Olya. Um, what is your, maybe walk us through, um, your own development from you know school from university um you have done many many different things you've been an entrepreneur you've been a translator you've been an import export manager um so you're very enterprising so why don't you walk us through <laughs> okay thank you for this question um yes i have a really interesting experience in my life um i was born and uh growed up uh, in the central part of Ukraine. After uh, graduating from school, I uh, moved in Kharkiv uh, <clears throat> uh, to study in the university and to become uh, an economist. Uh, and uh, I lived in Kharkiv like uh, from uh, 2006 uh, till uh, 2014. Uh, in 2000, I uh, graduated from Kharkov National University of Economics and uh, two years uh, I worked as a, actually three years, <laughs> I worked uh, as an export and import manager and uh, in 2014 I, have, I had to move from Kharkiv uh, to Kyiv uh, because uh, actually uh, in 2014 the war in Ukraine began. Uh, it was about occupation of uh, annexing and occupation of Crimea and uh, Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk region. <clears throat> uh, those times uh, were not uh, calm in Kharkiv also. 
So uh, I decided that it would be best, better for me and for my family to move in Kiev. When I uh, moved in Kiev, I, I dis, uh, understood that um, I do not want actually to work uh, as an expert and input manager, but uh, I wanted to try myself as a, an entrepreneur. So I um, had some projects. One of them was about uh, designing clothes, women's clothes. And another one was about a training program uh, for uh, people who uh, need to work with, uh, with their self-value. So fashion, clothing for women, self-value, is there a connection? Yes. <laughs> uh, finally, I understood that it's all about love to oneself. It's about respectful, uh, respectiveness for oneself. And uh, um, for that period of time, I didn't realize what exactly I want uh, to do in this life. A uh, few years, I was uh, actually, uh, I, uh, I'm, I had a kid, I have a kid, and uh, he is a uh, children, uh, I'm sorry, child, <laughs> and he is uh, five years old. Uh, and. Um, for that time, uh, I was like um, uh, with my kid and uh, trying to do my business. Okay. And uh, for that period of time, I also realized that I need um, some other perspective and I need some uh, other uh, profession probably. So I started uh, to search what profession is good for me enough? I mean, like, it, um, it's about me, it's about my values, it's about uh, my point of view, and it's about my capability to support and to help other people in way I can do it. So uh, I found coaching profession. <laughs> and in uh, 2020, I uh, have found a coaching training program, so I entered it. And uh, in the December of 2020, I was certified as ACC ICF coach. Since uh, that, that is a lot of work to do this in such a short time frame. I can tell from own experience. So bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Since that uh, period, uh, I have my coaching practice and uh, I am volunteering. And uh, I'm volunteering uh, in uh, ICF Ukraine Charter Chapter. Uh, I volunteer uh, as a um, leader of some uh, projects. Uh, I volunteered as an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm sorry, interpreter. Karsten, can we make? I can hear you. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. And um, uh, I volunteered also making some. Uh, posts on Facebook with the greetings of our new members, of our uh, new certified coaches. So that was my job in volunteering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're also part of a task force now uh, from ICF Ukraine to reach out to other ICF. So ICF stands for International Coaching Federation. It is the largest international professional body of coaches in the world. And um, so you're also reaching out to other chapters to see how you can collaborate, how they can help uh, during war times now, right? Yes, yes, it's true. Uh, I have, uh, first of all, I have contacted uh, to ICF Germany chapter chapter. Uh, I uh, wrote them a letter and uh, I received very uh, soon uh, the response. And it was full of warmth and it was full of um, sincere desire to help us. And uh, I feel a lot of gratitude for this. We have already uh, implemented some projects like uh, supervision uh, uh, meetings with uh, Ukrainian uh, coaches. And uh, we are going to, to uh, provide uh, pro bono coaching for Ukrainian coaches. And uh, we are also looking for some other uh, ways to cooperate and to and I, I hope to uh, get help in other ways. Mm -hmm. Great. And we will talk about that also uh, in a bit. Um, 
Well, yeah, let us understand a little bit the situation that that Ukraine is facing and also how it kind of developed historically. So, um, so maybe I'll try to to summarize and, and then you can see if, if that is correct from your standpoint or, or what else you see. So um, the, the history of Ukraine or the history of Kiev goes back much longer than, for example, the history of Moscow. It's a it's an older uh, tradition. It's an older history. Um, there's also a um, a background or a, um, a a country rules which kind of resides in this um, in the in the Ukraine and actually over the years over the decades reached out to different areas. Um, so it expanded. It was a um, a country where there was a lot of trading going on where there also was a lot of prosperity kind of collected. Um, and this is now a kind of part of the argumentation why Ukraine and Russia somehow should be one country from a Russian perspective. But from the Ukrainian perspective, that is not the case. It was always a Ukrainian thing. So maybe let's start there. Um, what's your, how would you, how would you describe that? Um. Actually, Kiev Rus begin from Kiev. <laughs> Kiev was the the capital of Kiev Rus, and um, this was very interesting and very uh, very nice and very very good country to live in. Um, this territory territory of Kiev and or, or Kiev Rus. Uh, was very interesting for other uh, people, for other um, countries uh, to take it over. So we had in our history a lot of wars and a lot of invasions, uh, a lot of battles, but we are for freedom. <laughs> and the Kiev Rus was also for freedom, like uh, later uh, Cossacks arise, yeah, and um, It, uh, like uh, the territory of Kiev Rus expanded to, to the south and uh, it's actually covering uh, the territory of Ukraine in, in some borders, not exactly these borders, but in some borders. Mm -hmm. um, Russia appeared and Moscow appeared later. Uh, and uh, we were neighbors but we were not the same country. Like saying about the same country uh, was about Soviet Union. And it is also a difficult page for Ukrainian history. Um, there were period in Ukrainian history when Ukraine was divided for left Ukrainian, left bank Ukrainian and right bank Ukrainian. But in these borders we have right now, we feel like we are Ukrainians and we are the nation and we are um, just Ukrainian people. So Olya, um, what, uh, what we understand here from the media is that uh, February 24th, um, there was a full blown war started from Russia, but from a Ukrainian perspective, that war, um, started earlier it started in 2014 can you t tell us from your own perspective how was it for you what what happened then and what changed also in your personal life with your with your friends that would be helpful mm -hmm. thank you for this question um actually uh, in my point of view the war uh, started uh, in uh, 2014 when uh, crimea was occupied and the next like next, but um, and uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk region were also occupied uh, by uh, Russians. And um, in my personal story, that uh, event, because of these events, I had to move in Kiev from Kharkov. Um, it was not easy period of time. 
uh, for me personally, because I had a lot of friends in Kharkiv, Kharkiv and um, colleagues and um, even teachers from the university. And some of them uh, were like, uh, they were greeting uh, this situation and uh, they uh, felt like uh, they want to move in Russia, but not to move in Russia, but uh, they wanted Russia move in Ukraine. It's like about 10 persons, not more, but they became my um, ex-friends because we couldn't uh, find uh, our common ground where we, can, we could stand for. And um, it was difficult to explain uh, those people that um, when I live in Ukraine, in some city of Ukraine, I have the right to live in this city of Ukraine. Um, so when I moved um, in Kiev, um, actually for me, this situation is a little bit um, similar, I mean today, because I had also some friends and even from uh, Russia or some other countries who um, are supporting now, um, not the war, but uh, the processes like uh, when Russia should uh, invade another country, like to save someone, and it's, it's not okay. We are living in Ukraine and uh, there is no need to save someone except from Russians. <laughs> we need to be saved from Russians. Mm -hmm. Can we shed some light on, for example, Crimea? So these are regions within the Ukrainian territory that historically have Russian settlers, have a Russian population in there. And somehow it's also a vacation or a retirement home. Can you, can you explain us a little bit? Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, there were their own uh, population like Crimean Tatars. And um, during period of Soviet Union, uh, there was some interesting process when um, Russian military or Soviet Union military uh, forces soldiers or someone else uh, from this area uh, were retired and uh, moved in Crimea just to live on their retirements. Uh, in Crimea because of good conditions, because of good uh, climate, and uh, it, it is very beautiful in Crimea. So uh, when um, they uh, lived and they stayed there, but they didn't feel like they were Ukrainians. They wanted to live in Soviet Union and then in Russia, but still living in Crimea. And uh, it's, it's, it's weird because uh, when I live in Kiev, and uh, I realized that I live in Ukraine. And if I want to move in some other country, I'm just moving in another country, but not saying that this territory is another country right now. Um, so I compare it a little bit to Germans traveling to Mallorca, but then saying this is Germany, not, not saying this is part of Spain, right? Yeah, it, it, it looks similar, yeah. But I have a lot of uh, friends uh, and um, colleagues and acquaintances who moved from Crimea in 2014 because they couldn't stay there. They lived their houses. They are refugees. They had to move, were forced to move because they didn't want to uh, live under occupation. occupation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that started way earlier. And then somehow there was a period of, let's say, ceasefire where there was no open, full-blown war. Um, and, and what changed for you personally in February 24th? I will remember that day probably of my life. Uh, I was uh, waked up by a call of my sister. She called me 5 and 40 a.m. And uh, she told me you have to wake up because the war began. I was just like, how it could happen? And I asked her if uh, I should uh, uh, bring my kid to kindergarten. She said, no, <laughs> the war began. <laughs> I couldn't believe her. Uh, 
um, but uh, I waked up and I uh, began to um, prepare myself uh, to leave from this apartment and to probably to move uh, in some shelter or even move uh, in the other part of Ukraine. I, I didn't, I haven't decision for that moment yet. And uh, at 7 a.m. I heard the siren sound and <laughs> actually my first panic attack happened then because I was uh, alone with my uh, son and he was sleeping and I had to uh, grab him somehow and to bring to the safe place. Mm. So uh, my first day of war was full of trembling. I, I couldn't cry actually the first day of war. I, I was like a priest and uh, I couldn't make any decision what should I do next. But next day, uh, we um, moved to the shelter with the uh, siren sounds. And uh, in a few hours, I understood that uh, we can stay there for a long time because it is very cold and too many people. And uh, it's, it's very bad for my kid and for myself, for my health. So we decided to move from Kiev. And... Um, when we decided, we just uh, took a taxi and just leave. I uh, haven't... You had uh, one suitcase that you could carry, probably yes, not much yes, more, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, just one suitcase. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was full of uh, my kids' <laughs> stuff. Uh, I had just like two or three pieces of clothes. And uh, when I moved here, I, I needed to find something. <laughs> um, um, we were moving on taxi and uh, the sirens uh, were sold out during our moment. And I was just sitting uh, ne next to the window and I was thinking, okay, and what is the next? Can we just move from this place? I, I realized that um, we, we can be um, quiet, we can be uh, under bombs and um, it was really difficult. I, I just even ha have no proper words to explain what were the feelings. And um... I would probably be scared to death, knowing that I'm a moving target with all the bombs coming, and my kid is with me, my son is with me. Yeah, I, it's hard. I mean, from yeah, honestly, it's hard for me to even feel or to imagine the thoughts or the feelings that you had to go through. Thank you. So we moved uh, in the central part of Ukraine and um, it is calmer and safer here, but uh, we still uh, have signals about uh, probable air raid attack and uh, we have to hide somehow. But we still keep uh, our we uh, keep uh, trying to find like what to do next. And uh, I am in the countryside. So um, this is the period of time when uh, uh, agriculture began uh, to work intensively. So it, it has started. And here is a little request and an invitation to you. The invitation to you is to our weekly impulse sessions every Friday morning at eight. It's called Impulse for Peace and Against Fear. Um, this is an open uh, room where people can come together and uh, exchange about how they are. Um, there is a, a guided meditation or another reflection or intervention. And then there is also a bit exchange around what can we do practically um, one step at a time to help enable peace in Ukraine. You can find uh, the events on our website, www.leadership-choices.com. It's right on the front page. You're all welcome to join every Friday morning, eight o'clock. And the second request is, if you have people that have flown from UK, Ukraine um, and can you make use of coaching, of business coaching, for example, entrepreneurs or self-employed people or people who have to start over their professional career now, uh, we are open to help. So simply reach us 
reach out to us um, at uh, karsten.draft at leadership-choices.com and we'll make sure that we get um, a coach assigned to them so that they can get the support they need right now to figure out what's next uh, in their life and how to actually make the best use of this crisis for their own you know, professional development. Um, so that's the request. So please um, help us to spread the word and uh, to help the people as, as good as possible. And we know that this is not an offer um, that might be in high demand right now. Um, people have to settle in first. There will some, be some primary needs that need to be uh, fulfilled first, but then uh, in a couple of months um, time or a couple of weeks, this will be very, very important and we will still be there. Um, so we're in here for the long haul. Okay, so help, please help spread the word. And now let's get back to the conversation, the interview with Olya. And Olya, I mean, you have, um, you're the breadwinner, you earn the money. Uh, you had a coaching practice. Um, how do you earn your living right now? How can you make money right now? Honestly to say, I have uh, no uh, income right now. Um, my clients um, who uh, worked with me before the war began, uh, they are uh, still are not ready for work. Uh, I have a lot of coaching, but almost all the coaching is volunteering. Sometimes I receive some kind of donations, such as like, thank you from, from a client, but I, I still uh, offer volunteering uh, pro bono coaching. Um, I'm looking forward another way uh, to uh, get income, but I realize that the coaching industry, industry in Ukraine uh, will not be Mm, so good as it was before the war began because um, uh, for coaching uh, could take place uh, uh, there should be business that should yeah. be people who can pay yeah, yeah. and business is ruined a lot in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. so first of all we have to recover business and then coaching will be possible for normal price in Ukraine mm. So that means you need to find a way somehow to earn your living again, at least until the industry, the business kind of picks back up and there's work again, right? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I'm thinking uh, to start uh, working with my uh, probable uh, international clients. Like uh, I'm going to register on platforms. Uh, and I, I think it, work, it will work. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, this period of time is full of turbulence. Um, I am doing a lot of things that I uh, even couldn't suppose that I will do it uh, before the war began. So it is also about creativeness. <laughs> it is also about, um, about to be brave and about to uh, find the way uh, we can we can stand this. Well, yeah, you are also, before the war, you started working in the field of resilience as one of your areas of specialization of expertise. Um, listening to you, you seem so strong. So um, it, it's, it almost sounds lighthearted to listen to you. How do you keep, how do you keep up faith? How do you keep up a positive outlook on life with all the madness going on around you. Thank you for this question. It's actually, I think uh, almost all Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians uh, will become very resilient and be good trainers in resilience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, for me, it's about uh, creating senses and meanings. And meanings. And uh, for me, it's about accepting what, what's going on as it is and to understand my responsibility that, um, about my responsibility, not to overestimate it. I can do, I have uh, some uh, magic pill that will uh, resolve all problems we have right now, but um, 
I can do my best uh, to do one step closer to our victory. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, I'm doing a lot of volunteering job. And now I'm still volunteering uh, as a coach, as a translator. I have, uh, I help um, in some projects uh, with a uh, first psychological ad, and I translate these materials from English to Ukrainian. So uh, then uh, these materials uh, are going to help people who need it. And uh, every step, every action I do uh, is uh, to be closer to our victory. Mm -hmm. And it helps to be resilient. We, we realize what we are standing for. We realize why we are doing it. And our values, you know, they are like sharpened. Uh, one of my basic value was freedom and another one humanity. <laughs> now they are very sharpened. Yeah. So I, I can rely on my values and it also helps me to stay resilient. Even if something is going very difficult and wrong, uh, I, I make a lot of mistakes doing new uh, actions, you know, like uh, when new task, uh, I'm just can be perfect in it. Um, and one more, um, I think, like side of uh, this resilient is uh, to be um, like more in self-compassion, mm -hmm. to be kind friend to myself and to be kind friend to my relatives, to my son, and it helps a lot. Oh, wow, uh, you amaze me. Um... Are there, are there, I mean, are there people around you that you can talk to when, on a darker day? Are, are you connected to you, are, I mean, where you are? Are you with family or are you somewhere alone without connections? Uh, I am with my, uh, with my son and with my relatives. Um, and um, I talk to my uh, friends who are in other places and just by phone or WhatsApp. Hmm. Um, from the very first day of the war, uh, I um, continued to be in contact with uh, dear family people. It also helps and it helps me and it helps other people because they also feel support. Yes, it is difficult for every one of us, but together we uh, can move forward. We can move uh, to some other better life. Did you ever consider leaving the country at all? Um, actually, yes. When I was like uh, 25 or 24, I thought about moving to another country. But when I left Kiev, uh, 25th uh, November, uh, February, February, yes, um, I, was, I was thinking, okay, my the biggest dream is to come back in Kiev. I want to live in Kiev. I want to live in Ukraine. And uh, I'm ready to do a lot to make Ukraine prosperity. Mm. To make wow. this place growing and developing. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, I think I, I can do it. Of course. I mean, we in play my... an important role. You can play an important role in this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I'm... I'm amazed by your strength um, and also by this feeling of we as a nation, we as a people, we want to achieve this, we want to stand together. I think this is also what um, has inspired many people outside of the Ukraine, you know, looking what is going on there, how the people are standing up, how the people are working together. Um, that spirit is, is simply very, inspirational is simply something where everybody tries to to help um even i also live in the countryside i live in a small village and even in this village we there are now refugee families from the ukraine um who, who are there there will be a welcome party tomorrow which i've never heard of in this in this place here at all so it's it's really um there's a lot of solidarity here, and i think that is also inspired by how you and your fellow um, uh, fellow citizens stand up and how you hold yourself in these difficult times. 
Mm. Thank you, thank you for sharing this. It's really amazing when I'm in Ukraine right now. Uh, I'm just also amazed uh, by Ukrainian people. Uh, from the first days, I wanted to find myself. How can I be useful? And I have found so many volunteering chats and so many just ordinary people who try to help at least somehow they can help. Um, and it is so common. Mm. There is no um, request about it from high, you know, it's just like the wish of everyone just to help and to be useful somehow. It, it, it's amazing phenomena, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's about leadership. It's just emerging leadership. It's about um, responsibility. And it's about strong desire. How is your president seen by the people? I mean, there's, I mean, from the out, from the countries abroad, I think there's a lot of admiration. He's, you know, presented like a hero almost without any flaws, simply perfect leader. Um, what's the perspective from you and, and your colleagues, your friends? Actually, now we admire our president. <laughs> um, we had uh, different uh, points of view when uh, the elections uh, were uh, last time. But uh, as I, I have uh, found uh, someday in uh, Facebook, uh, that there is 100% of Ukrainians. And uh, actually, uh, earlier, uh, we were like dividing 25% um, and 75%, uh, depending on uh, which um, candidate uh, who are voting. But now we are just 100% who um, support each other, who support our president, who support our army, and uh, who support just Ukraine as it is. So there's a lot of coming together as a people. And um, do you still have friends in, in Russia or that are Russians that you find a common ground to stay connected on? Oh. It's a difficult question. Um, I have uh, posted my um, connections with Russian colleagues because from the very beginning, they couldn't even uh, say that this is war. Mm -hmm. They call it special operation and uh, there's no desire, no wish to talk about it, like about sufferings, about um, pain, about uh, people dying. Real about dying, about murdered people, about raped women. They just do not want to talk about it. They just see some, some different way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not ready to talk uh, for, with some of my friends. I have um, colleagues who are Russians who live in other countries and it is easier to talk with them. Okay, okay. So it's not the fact that they are Russian, it's the fact that they live in this regime that makes it hard to be honest and be genuine in, in your connections with them. Yes, yes. And, but it is, uh, there are also some um, difficulties in communication. Um, I would not like to say that it's so difficult, but um, some misunderstanding there is also have, have place. Um, for example, uh, I know that sanction on Russia uh, um, Make some made some effect on Russian people, and um, it's difficult for me to hear that uh, Russian people are poor because of sanctions. I just can't understand this because I'm in Ukraine where people dying, mm -hmm. where just murdered, mm -hmm. not because of some I don't know uh, material values, but just for it's about value of human life. So there are some difficulties in talking about this, but I, I'm still open and I believe that um, human values will be much uh, stronger than any material values. So um, it, it can be our common ground. Just when we uh, start to admit that the life is more important than uh, some materials, things, and power, mm -hmm. power or economics, life is more important. 
then it will be better. It would be better to find our common ground. Mm. Oh yeah, that's actually actually also what I really have a difficulty to figure out. So um, I can imagine a situation where there's a ceasefire. I can even imagine that there will be a treaty signed that Russia kind of claims some sort of victory, whatever that might be, and then leave the country again. Um, but what I find hard to imagine is how there will be peace. I mean, peace in the sense of two neighbors, two neighboring countries that respect each other, that respect each other's integrity. I mean, we have, Germany and France have fought two world wars against each other. Um, and and over the over that decades, I would say there is a, a sort of a friendship, a sort of a mutual respect that has grown, but it took like, I don't know, 70 years, something like that. Um, do, do you have any idea how there can be peace again with Russia? Um, uh, I think, yes. Uh, I think and, uh, it's about some kind of positions of, of ordinary people even, even so. Uh, yes, it's about politicians, it's about uh, military forces, but it's also about uh, ordinary people. Um, as for me, it's about, uh, okay, uh, just a uh, prehistory there. Uh, uh, yes, uh, but um, um, it's like a Russian uh, military forces and Putin uh, said that uh, they are uh, saving Russian speaking uh, people in Ukraine from Nazists or some other, I don't know, whom I, they are saving us from. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, Russian militarians uh, behaves them like we call them fascism. They are raping women, they murdering civilians. They are bombing schools, hospitals, uh, just houses with no uh, strategical or military objects uh, allocated. And um, it's like, it's like about mirror, but incorrect mirror. So when uh, just ordinary Russian people will realize that there is no superior position about Ukrainians, that we are equal, I think then we can try to find common ground. Mm. And that we are equal, we are nation, Ukrainian nation. It's not about like brotherhood with uh, Russia. No, we are a separate nation. And then when they realize it, and uh, when they uh, will respect our borders, both geographical and mental and uh, personal of every Ukrainian, probably there will be space for some talk. Mm -hmm. In other terms, a mindset shift from yes. what they are is today. And I would assume that this is not possible with the current regime, right? That, that this probably needs to change. I think uh, current regime just will not, not allow this even small shift. Hmm. So it's about the change in the regime. Yeah, well, okay. Um, and Olya, I mean, obviously we here, we watch this every day, every every morning in, in social media, in the TV, it's very, very present. People are reacting strongly to it. There was a lot of solidarity uh, in terms of money, in terms of donations, in terms of helping, sending goods. And there's still this feeling of ho um, helplessness, like, what can we do? We just look like bystanders. We feel like bystanders. We can't do much, um, it looks like. So from your perspective, um, to the listeners here of this podcast, um, what, what do you think is possible? What would be helping? Um, what can people do to support Ukrainian people? No, for me, it's about uh, keeping supporting. Just step by step, every day, just keep support. Um, if we are talking about ordinary people are doing what they are doing right now and just keep doing it. Um, 
I, I, as I said, I have a role of volunteer uh, in uh, ICF Ukraine charter chapter, and sometimes it is uh, we are trying to um, be in contact with our coaches, and sometimes it is also difficult to understand what they need, what need, what help is needed for them. But we just uh, keep contacting them, keep uh, clarifying what help is needed, and trying to provide this help uh, as we can do. And um, when we speak about uh, some higher levels, uh, like uh, politicians or diplomatics, uh, we need to be in safe. Ukrainians need to be in safe. And I believe that we need uh, to close the sky. It, it's just my human position mm -hmm. because we just want to live. Mm -hmm. So in other terms that there is a air defense shield put on by NATO, even though there would risk a further escalation potential to World War III, there will be something that from your perspective, if there's no more bomb falling from the sky, that F would actually make a huge difference. It, it will make a huge difference for those who are suffering from bomb yeah. falling and who are dying yeah. from them. Every day, yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day, mm -hmm. yes. Probably, I, I'm not a, a politician, yeah, and uh, I have no diplomatic experience yet, but um, I, as I think uh, the Western world and other countries should find the way to unite from this aggression, mm -hmm. to, to stand against it, just not to be neutral, to find some creative way, yeah, to, to find how to stop it and how to support Ukraine in its moment to a victory. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And um, oh yeah, in terms of, we are both coaches. Um, what can coaches do? Is there anything, I mean, um, is there anything that you think we are prepared, we are equipped, I mean, with our training, is there anything how we could be effective in, this, in the current situation? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, you are already uh, helping us and thank you a lot. We, we have a lot of um, help from different chapters, uh, as I already mentioned, and uh, even we have pro bono coaching and uh, this is very um, specific uh, help. Um, in a deeper level, probably we should uh, talk more about values. Um, we should talk more about ethics because uh, we make impact to other people. Mm -hmm. And this way, uh, we should be very um, aware of what impact we are making right now. So it's, it's, it would be a very great job to uh, be in contact, in deep contact with deep values. Mm -hmm. and to discuss it a lot, to find uh, the way how we can understand the same values in the same way. But what I think will, will work a lot from coaching, for coaching yeah. society. Okay, so actually take this context of what is happening right now, what does it mean for our values, to simply take this into coachings when we work with business leaders, when we work with leaders, to also bring this into the coaching conversation. Is that what you say? And uh, I, I also would like to add that um, somehow uh, to help our clients to understand um, the consequences of every decision. It's about awareness. Mm. And they, it's about social responsibility. Mm. It is also important because if a business um, have a priority of money only, it will not work for common prosperity. Yeah, in, in the long run, right? Because yes. it will always be for the trying to have the local optimization. Like, do we continue business with Russia right now or not? Um, are we benefiting kind of from the situation? Are we withdrawing? Um, that is a decision that. Um, leaders have to make right now when they work internationally. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for that um, very thought, uh, thoughtful conversation, also for your personal insights and, and your feelings. Is there, uh, what is it that I haven't asked you yet? 
actually my uh, question um, is also about responsibility. And um, actually you have mentioned um, uh, this type, what, what can we do um, yes, for, 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 help, for helpful assistance? And um, there is a question that I uh, put myself every day from the war began, and it was about what can I do today? What small steps or big steps can I do today just to um, make the victory closer? Mm -hmm. And I would like to share you this question, just asking yourself, what today can I do to make this victory closer? Mm -hmm. Because it is not only about victory of Ukraine, it is about victory of Europe and about a victory of all the world. We all live on the planet Earth. So it's it's victory, of, victory of your two strong values, humanity and freedom. Yes. Humanity and freedom. Yeah. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful, right? To what can we do? What what can each of us contribute? Where can we be creative? Small steps, big steps. Okay, let's leave it with this thought. Oh yeah. So um, if you if you allow, if you are interested, if you allow, um, I would like to invite you um, to reinvite you to another podcast in a couple of months, simply to hear. How you're doing how things have developed um would that be something thank you a lot it, it's a good idea and uh, i would love to join the podcast one more time or even probably more times if you like it and uh, it's, it's a really good idea to keep talking about so important things thank Excellent. you karsten oh you're very welcome that's such a small step for for me and and so easy um and and this i think it's a good thing for us to also to hear how you are developing how you see uh, the situation and i think also it will be a, a period of strong growth for you as a professional as a person as a mother as a human being um a, a resilience um course in resilience as you as you said it yourself so um let's see how this goes further oh yeah let's keep in touch all the best to you stay safe Thank you, Karsten. It was nice to see you. It was nice to meet you and to be here. Thank you a lot. Have a Thank good you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye. And what have you learned, Karsten? That is a very powerful question that Olya ended with. What is the one thing that you can do today to help to end the war, to help to enable the victory of freedom, uh, humanity and peace? and that we all can think of that. What is the one little thing that we can do today? And um, yeah, I would like to extend that thought to you. What is it that you think um, is the one thing that you can do? What are things that you are um, have been trying out? Um, was it that, uh, that you are contemplating doing? Um, why don't you share your thoughts with us? Um, you can simply write us at Leaders Talk at leadership-choices.com and uh, we'll be very happy to hear from you um, and now um, please stay safe please stay healthy and uh, looking forward to our next episode together with you at leaders talk bye for now this was an episode of leaders talk the interview podcast portraying leaders who are committed to better leadership better organizations and a better world powered by Leadership Choices. If you want to give us feedback, please send an email to leaderstalk at leadership-choices.com. Thank you for listening.